those markers which can cause sudden cardiac death first of all because that's how we can try to initially focus upon the management of the patient so there can be various of the channelopathies which can cause this problem otherwise even of the structural heart diseases in the structural heart diseases the most common structural heart diseases which we come across is ARVs and of course the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy similarly there are a lot of channelopathies as well which can cause all these problems like the short or the longer version of the QT intervals and also the ventricular tachycardias the catecholaminergic polymorphic VTs or even the Brugada syndrome and we are already aware that there are certain problems as well uh, especially in the young athletes which we come across a lot of times is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy may be there or even if there is a left ventricular hypertrophy several times of course they do tend to have coronary artery anomalies as well or even ruptured aorta so what tends to happen is uh, now coming to one of the other abnormalities which is called as the ARVD so ARVD is the arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia so if you will try to see carefully in the lead v1 to v3 you will come across as there will be t inversion from v1 to v3 indeed isn't it and then other than that so what what are the other changes you come across in this ecg uh, can anyone recall what are the other changes do you come across in this ecg epsilon wave yes exactly so that's what uh, we saw it no we said it like in the v1 to v3 and then the epsilon waves although it is the most specific sign for this similarly you will also notice there will be prolonged s wave upstroke which is of nearly 55 milliseconds especially in the lead v1 to v3 and again in the v1 v3 if you look further carefully you will also notice there's localized widening of the qrs and that again finding is present only in the v1 to v3 and if you will be having a recording of the ecg especially of the tachycardia you will notice these patients tend to have paroxysmal episodes of vt and the morphology is left bundle branch block okay so if you'll try to look on the histology this is how they look like isn't it so that is some of the things which you all have to be careful so similarly the other form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy which can be present is mostly localized to apex so in the apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, as i said it you may notice what is called as a giant t wave inversion which is present only in the apical leads okay so as you can see it over here however uh, it has been localized mostly to the japanese population so uh, you may also notice some of the times like uh, for the you know the arrhythmias which will be happening due to these causes in fact atrial fibrillation is the most common svt which is present and on almost nearly 10 percent of them so a lot of times if you really want to know about the ventricular hypertrophy you should be aware of the criteria as well so what are the different criteria which is present if you want to localize them so if you want to localize them uh, you should be knowing there are various criteria like the sokolov leon voltage criteria otherwise also cornell voltage criteria as well so in sokolov leon criteria there's if you add up the s wave in v1 plus the r wave in v5 it will be more than 3.5 millivolts similarly the r wave in avl will be more than 1.1 millivolt okay and then for the corneal voltage criteria they try to add up the s wave in v3 plus r wave in the avl if it is more than 2.8 only then for men however for women they are a little bit lenient in the sense if it is more than two millivolts itself it will be for the females so other than these criteria you should also try to look out for other criteria as well other criteria means is stt changes 
Are there left atrial enlargements? Similarly, are there any deep and narrow Q waves as well? And however, of course, if there is ventricular hypertrophy, you will be seeing those uh, criteria changes as well. So as I had already given you an inter uh, overview, so what are the common causes which tends to cause sudden cardiac death in the athletes, okay? Right? So I'm sure now you'll be able to distinguish and also identify these cardiomyopathies. So after knowing through the cardiomyopathies, so now we'll go to the next segment. And then the next segment will be about the channelopathies. So what are these channelopathies actually? So channelopathies are nothing but basically the genetic defects in the gene coding. And they are the ones which will be leading to ECG abnormalities. Okay, and they are the ones which lead to life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. So on the ECG, if you'll be trying to see, you may see either short QT, long QT, or even Brugada syndromes as well. In the long QT, what happens? Okay, the one of the most common forms which you normally see is Romano Ward syndrome. In Romano Ward syndrome, what will be happening is there is prolonged depolarization of the ventricle. There is already standard definition as well, what is called as for the QT corrected. QT corrected is root of RR interval divided by QT interval. So that's how you get the corrected QT interval. Corrected QT imp is important because you should be able to define a QT interval which is independent of the cycle length. So because if someone is having a bradycardia, that is the time when you can have uh, prolonged QT, but you don't want all these kind of things. So for that, what you do is, you try to correct, uh, to get is the corrected QT interval. So this is the formula which I was telling you. So this is what is called as the Bezet's formula for getting this right so you should always be careful how are you taking the tangent from this t wave and using that is the one you will be able to get it in fact so what happens is there are different types will be having different uh, ways of uh, getting aggravated as well in the sense one will be the one which during which tends to happen during exertion so one being the first one a lot of exertion, swimming, exertion, emotion, like this. However, the long t, t, uh, the long QT2 is the one which needs auditory triggers. Auditory triggers, for example, if someone drinks a phone and gets a arrhythmia, like that. Similarly, otherwise, postpartum period, postpartum period. Okay, so postpartum period is a mother who, for example, has already delivered a baby and then gets a problem. Then comes the long QT3. Long QT3 is the one which is associated with scn 5 a mutation. Okay, don't forget that. So that is the one when the arrhythmias is going to happen during the sleep. In the sense, a lot of times you, you would have heard, no, someone died during the sleep. And if it is due to QT uh, prolonged, most commonly it would have been long QT3. In fact, so scn 5 a mutation. Don't forget about that, okay? So as I was telling you, uh, so I, has, I had already said it about the type 1, type 2, type 3. So the type 1, as I had, so what you notice is there's broad-based T wave, broad T wave, okay? However, the type 2 is the one with notched or biphasic T wave, okay? T wave is more of a biphasic, okay? However, for the type 3, there is long isoelectric. So, for example, the T wave will be a normal, uh, like a narrow, small one. There will be a isoelectric interval. Okay, isoelectric interval, which is present normally after the T wave. So, as I had said it about type 1, 2, 3, don't forget. So, the type 1 is during exertion, during swimming, exertion or emotion. And the type 2 was for either in peripartum period, otherwise due to auditory, auditory stimulus. And the long QT3 was 
the SCN5A mutation, which was happening during rest or even sleep. So as you may notice over here, so QT is pretty prolonged, right? Even the, uh, the other thing what tends to happen is there's also like one, two, three, four, okay, sinus rhythm. I wouldn't say it has bradycardia. But of course, QTC is also prolonged. However, now what is happening in this ECG? So in this ECG, if you look carefully, the T wave seems to be biphasic and the notched as well. So this is the one with type 2. Then comes this ECG. So in this ECG, what do you notice is, yes, T wave seems to be pretty narrowed. And after that, there is a isoelectric interval and of course a P. So this is the long QT interval with type 3. Which is which is the one which is associated with SCN5A mutation, in fact. So there is a very important term, if you look carefully in the ECG, what is called as the macroscopic T-wave alternance. So why the alternance? Alternance is the one which refers to the alteration of the T-wave in polarity or even amplitude. So what will happen is, in the long lead 2, a T-wave with positive polarity will be followed with next negative T wave polarity okay and it keeps on alternating so what do you as if you this is the rhythm strip okay so in the rhythm strip what is happening so you see initially is the positive and the negative T wave and which keeps on alternating isn't it that's what we are noticing over here so this is a young kid which was having the same problem and who has already has had multiple episodes of cardiac arrest. So, if anyone is having a long QT, are they all going to die? No. So, what are the risk factors for that? So, the risk factors you should be trying to see further if someone has had a history of aborted cardiac arrest, otherwise if there is a family history, syncope, T wave alternance, Otherwise, even prolonged QTC or if there are events in the first year of the life as well. So, torsades, we are already aware of what is called as the twisting around the line. So, there is actually a polymorphic VT which you tend to see, especially in the setting of a QT prolongation. And there is intervals like the irregular rhythms, like the long, short R intervals, which you commonly see. So, this is how they look like, especially on the ECG. Okay. This is the trigger point over here. What tends to happen is, so already if you may notice over here, there's slightly prolonged QT. And then over here, it starts to take shape in the form of a twisting which is present. And this is the characteristic, what is called as Tursat's D point. So there are, so VPBs were coming. Yes, this one as well. And then came like two VPBs and boom. Patient deteriorates. So, uh, there are several diagnostic criteria as well, using which one can identify. You can give some scoring in the form of, uh, for example, how prolonged is the QT. So, if it is more than 480 milliseconds, you tend to give 3, 460 to 479, 2, 450 to 59 is like 1. Similarly, uh, for example, if you have already done the exercise stress test for the person and you see a prolonged QT, okay, four minutes, like after the exercise, again, you can give one score. And if someone has had or recorded torsades, you will give like almost two points. T wave alternance, you can give one point. And if there is notched T wave in three leads, again, one. Similarly, if there is low heart rate, for age, you will give, be giving us 0.5. Similarly, if someone is having a clinical history of syncope, with stress, you give one, 2. Without stress, will be 1. Similarly, if someone is having a positive family history with the prolonged QT, that is the time you will be giving score of 1. Okay. So, now the lot of times what will be happening is you will be coming across those... Uh, ECGs, what is happening is, in which you notice is this prolonged J wave. 
especially if there's someone is having a wider QRS. Otherwise, there's a accessory pathway in the form of a WP, W syndrome or there's an interventricular conduction defect. In those cases, of course, the measurement of the JTC is the much more accurate. Much more accurate. Why am I telling is, okay, let me try to show you what is exactly the difference. So this is the J point which refers to the junction point. So this is the QRS and this is the like the QT interval which is coming over here. So starting from the J to the end of the T wave is the one which refers to the JT interval. So as I already said it, so what happens is, yeah, most commonly 320 to 400 milliseconds will be there. As I said it, this is not, you don't... Uh, do it much often. However, only if any of the patient is having, uh, for example, uh, on the ECG bundle branch block pattern is there, then sudden positive changes where the, that's why bundle branch block pattern or otherwise accessory path is there. Another important phenomenon, what is called is the prolonged QT dispersion. So in the prolonged QT dispersion, there's a maximum and minimum QT interval and what happens is if it is more than 65 there is a high risk for ventricular arrhythmias and it is definitely a risk marker for sudden cardiac death however 40 to 50 milliseconds it is pretty normal so no need to be worried about that but if it is more than 65 yes you have to be worried about that similarly if there is a increased QT dispersion there will be a risk in homogeneity of the ventricular action potential and definitely it is a marker for the sudden cardiac death. So most of us are definitely aware that okay long QT interval is a bad marker but similarly if the QT is also very small as well then this is also not a good marker. In the sense you will be noticing uh, the, this is short QT interval is already a autosomal uh, dominant and three main genetic variants are there and what happens is uh, in fact they all tend to involve the potassium channel genes and in fact the short QT one is the most common interval okay So now you can understand it very well. So similarly, in the short QT interval as well, uh, how much is the definition? So can anyone recall over here? So the interval is, if it is less than 330 milliseconds, it is going to be short QT interval, okay? So what will happen is, um, however, if one is in the range of 330 to 360, so you will need further additional criteria. Additional criteria in the sense, like pathogenic mutation, there is a family history of sudden cardiac death or even short QT syndrome as well so you should be able to uh, uh, you know uh, identify those people and this is how, how the short QT ECG will be looking like so the T wave is characteristically narrow and also symmetrical and the other ones will be having the history of atrial fibrillation and even VT or VF as well so this is another 16 year old boy which was presenting with history of syncope. So what do we notice over here is, this is a 12 lead ECG of a patient in sinus rhythm. And when we notice the QT interval, corrected QT interval, it is 280 milliseconds. So already 
cardiac arrest and syncope has been uh, uh, some of those most common presenting features, especially for the patients of ventricular arrhythmias. And we also need to be aware that syncope is the leading cause for this uh, 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 is the one which tends to normally happen for the ventricular arrhythmias. And yes, they may also have atrial arrhythmias like the atrial fibrillation and flutter. So what tends to happen is the diagnostic criteria for the short QT interval is, as we can see it over here. Again, you will be giving the scoring. Scoring will be, for example, on the basis of total score, if it is more than 4, there is a high risk for short QT syndrome. Similarly, 3 for intermediate risk and less than 2 for low risk. So, the another uh, really hyped mechanism in arrhythmias, especially for the sudden cardiac death is what is called as the Brugada syndrome. So in the Brugada syndrome, what tends to happen? So in the Brugada syndrome, you will be noticing is, as I, I was already telling, so it's a mutation of actually SCN5A. SCN5A gene is the one which is also responsible for the long QT3, in fact. And most of these uh, people who die are young men who tend to die from the ventricular fibrillation. And in fact, you do notice there is downsloping ST elevation, especially in the right precordial leads, okay, on the ECG. So the ECG pattern can be present at the baseline, or even intermittently as well, you may be noticing. So there are three types of brigadas. So in the sense of, so if you'll try to look carefully, the ST elevation point, especially in the lead V1, V2, V3, you may start appreciating the difference. Okay, so what is happening is in the type 1, you see what is called as the curved type ST segment elevation, and of course, they are there in the right sided precordial leads, right? And then in the type 2 and 3, rather than a curving, it is more of a saddleback. Saddleback is there. So this was a young patient uh, when the ECG was being done and then it was noticed the type of arrhythmia which that patient had. Although if we look carefully there is coving of the ST segment which is present which is the one which is classical for Brugada syndrome and of course in the sinus rhythm we see it a characteristic ECG. So, all the other markers, especially for the Brugada syndrome patients, if there is a prolonged QRS duration as well, so they will be more predisposed for the life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. So what tends to happen is if the QRS duration mean is 129 plus minus 24 milliseconds, so they tend to be more um, symptomatic rather than the ones which is like 16 milliseconds in fact. So again, this is again another uh, patient. Uh, so one of the other important and nice tricks which you can apply in these kind of patients is try to do a high lead ECG. High lead ECG is, is in the sense, so you can try to keep the, the ECG leads in the third uh, the, uh, and the second intercostal space, okay? So, you'll be able to notice it a little bit early, okay? So, other than the placement of the higher lead ECG, you can also try to do is give some drugs to those patients. What are the drugs do you give to them is? Agmaline. Agmaline, if you give like 1 mg per kg infusion over 10 minutes, uh, you will be able to notice uh, the unmasking of the Brigada syndrome. Similarly, for the flecanide as well, you tend to notice these kind of changes. 
So, but the fluconine, you have to give the IV intravenous dosages will be in the form of 2, and two milligram per kg IV infusion. I think the procainamide, the procainamide as well, you tend to give as 10 mg per kg IV infusion over 10 minutes. So, what was happening for this ECG, if you look carefully, is once the uh, IV fluconid uh, infusion was started, later on with passage of time, Brugada syndrome started becoming more and more evident, right? So similarly, so for example, this is the resting ECG and this is during the Agmelin testing. So that's what you notice. So a lot of times a common question comes is when would you like to perform the provocative test for such patients? So for example, if someone is ha really symptomatic, otherwise there is a family history. Okay, so that is the idle time you should try to perform this. So for the CPVT, CPVT is more of a familiar arrhythmogenic disorder. So there will be a lot of family members which may be having this problem. And then you will be note, able to notice there's severe arrhythmia, especially in the young patients. However, when you do a echo, it will be absolutely normal. So these patients are associated with very high mortality. And in fact, these such kind of patients are associated with a normal ECG at rest. So, uh, uh, most of the times they are triggered by adrenergic stimulus, in fact. So, during the ECG, this is how you do you notice. However, once you start doing the, you start to expose them for exercise stress test. So, in, in the initial stages, what do we notice is, it is coming in the form of bigeminy. However, later on during exercise, this VPC's frequency starts to increase and later on, in fact, it becomes frequent sustained ventricular tachycardia as well. So one should be really careful whenever you are seeing VPVs, especially during the exercise testing. And yes, a lot of times what may happen is you may be able to notice even in the younger patients as well. So uh, whenever you are doing a stress testing for any of these patients, be careful for the history of dizziness, syncope or even aborted sudden death as well for such kind of patient. And regarding the accessory pathways, if you notice, uh, we are already aware the incidence is not too much but for example one to two person every thousands of those patients can be having an accessory pathway and really these kind of patients may be having sudden cardiac death due to the exact transmission of the fast atrial rate from the atrium to the ventricle so as i was telling you for the atrial fibrillation it's a risk procedure even for example what tends to happen is uh, uh, a lot of times, uh, uh, yeah, so this is a classical example. If you look carefully, what is happening is over here is this irregular RR interval. Irregular RR interval. And there's slight pre-excitation as well, which is present. So, isn't it? So this is not a ventricular tachycardia, but this is atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rate in the presence of a accessory pathway. So, other than that, one of the uh, other common certain cardiac death markers is G point elevation. So, how much of G point elevation is considered to be significant? Can anyone recall? No one recalls? The isoelectric line. Yes, more than how much it should be? There are so many people who are there. Huh? So more than 0 0.1 millivolt. So 0 0.1 millivolt is... So 1 millivolt... Don't you remember? So for example, if 
you notice between two adjacent leads okay and there is a slurring or the notching morphology if you notice over there so if it is more than 0.1 millivolt that itself you'll be calling it as j point elevation in fact a lot of times you will be coming across patients who are not having symptomatic arrhythmias so they are the ones who tend to have this kind of thing similarly in the early repolarization syndrome it tends to apply for the patients who display early repolarization mostly in the inferior and or lateral leads okay where they have had a history of aborted cardiac arrest documented ventricular fibrillation or even polymorphic VTA as well. So what happens is, if you will, hopefully you will already recall what I said as the J point. J point is the junction of the QRS and ST junction. To call it as early repolarization, it should not be like, you know, there's just one lead which is there and you say no. So, in a segment lead, segment lead I mean is for example in the inferior leads, otherwise lateral leads, at least it should be present in two successive leads. For example, in the inferior leads like 2, 3 AVF, at least two of them should be present. Similarly, for the lateral leads like 1 AVL, V4, V5, V6, at least two of them should be present. Okay? And as I already said it, uh, the repolarization value should be at least as 0.1 millivolt, okay, and the successive leads, in fact. So, this is how it looks like. So, for example, as I was telling you, so this is the J point, and this is how you call it as ST elevation, ST segment elevation, and this is the J wave. So, J wave is a small deflection which is coming almost like after the QRS wave, in fact. So this is the J point and the slurred J wave. And then malignant J wave pattern has already been some said like, you know, there are high risk features for the sudden cardiac death in the early repolarization pat patients in fact. And the early repolarization in the inferior leads or global early pattern in fact. And you may be able to notice the J wave amplitude almost more than 0.2 millivolts and terminal notching may be present. So would anyone like to try this ECG to describe what do you notice? What do you notice in this ECG? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I asked this question that would anyone like to try to describe this ECG? No, no, no. And that's why then I paused for like five seconds. So, anyone would like to say, what do you notice in this ECG? There's already things written over here as well. You can read it out, in fact. What do you notice? Okay. Let me try to see. So, what do you, one of the first things, what do you notice is there is, it's a sinus rhythm, right? The axis is also normal. Then after that, what do you notice is, there is bradycardia. So, almost the heart rate is 42 beats per minute. And then what you notice is this repolarization and especially what is called as early repolarization. Why is it early repolarization? There's also the presence of the J wave, right? Which I showed to you maybe like 30 seconds before, right? So this is what yeah. is the J wave. Yes. So why why are you not guys not able to say anything? Okay, anyways. So, J wave is the one which is coming over here 
which is present in the form of slurred and notched waves. And in how many leads are they present, in fact? So they are present in almost all the leads, V1 to V6 and all the precordial leads as well. So definitely this person is having early repolarization. So even for this early repolarization syndrome as well, there is something called as a scoring system, Shanghai scoring system, which is present. Over here, what tends to happen is, so the scoring is depending upon the history, the ECG features, the family history, and then on the basis of that, you may also include the genetic test results as well. So on the basis of that, of course, we can give, is it a high risk, low risk, or the medium risk person. So, so if you want to really do a risk stratification of these patients, so you try to see from the lower risk to the higher risk in the sense. So if someone is having only horizontal or descending ST segment, otherwise something like the increased J wave amplitude or otherwise even more widespread J wave distribution, they're slightly lower. However, if someone is having features like the short coupled VPBs, otherwise family history of sudden cardiac death as well, they are the ones who will be having a very high risk for the arrhythmias. So one of the other uh, problems which those patients can be having is something is called as the idiopathic ventricular fibrillation. So how would you define ventricular fibrillation? How would you define such patients? So for such patients, what you notice is someone has already been revived. In fact, a lot of times you may be able to record the rhythm as well. And a lot of times what will happen is, of course, uh, among the etiologies, you have already ruled out the common etiologies, including that of the heart, the respiratory system, the metabolic and also the toxicological etiologies as well. And that is the when, time when you will be calling it as idiopathic ventricular fibrillation. Most of these patients tend to have normal ECG. And a uh, lot of times uh, a corrected QT interval will be, if you will calculate for such patients, they tend to be normal in fact. So the hallmark for such patients is like the, it is more of a typical short coupled PVC. And then, so for example, I'll try to give you an example. So what is happening is, this is the sinus rhythm of the ECG of the patient. And then over here, what tends to happen is, there's a short coupled PVC. Do you notice it over here, the first one? And then what is happening? What is this rhythm? I spoke... No, before that, that's a good guess at least. So you are reading the slides. Other than what was it, what I had said, VF is coming later on, okay. But before this, what is this? I already showed you an example as well. Torsats, right. Good. Why your voice is so low? You didn't have your breakfast today? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you are already sleeping, is it? Okay, never mind. So, so, so be confident, okay? So that's how we all learn. We make, do make some mistakes as well. And sometimes then we proceed, okay? Don't worry. Good, good try, good try. So I had shown you some examples as well for that, right? So make it more interactive. If you try to make it more one way, you will also go to sleep. I will also go to sleep. Okay. So what are those other markers which is presented? Fragmented QRS. So how do you define fragmented QRS? Can anyone try? So what happens is, due to the defective intramyocardial conduction delay, which is present secondary to the fibrosis or the scar tissue, the fragmented QRS tends to happen. And of course, the typical bundle branch blocks are not seen. 
So anyone would like to try what is happening in this ECG? Never be afraid of making mistakes, okay? So what is happening in this ECG? Okay, and? And what else? There are two spikes fragmented. Mm -hmm. That uh, is ST elevation. Okay. And? So at least I'm so happy that everyone is a little bit opening their mouth. So not everyone is asking. So what is happening is, first thing what do we notice is there's prolonged Q, QRS, right? Then after that, one of the other things what do we notice is, over here there are two spikes over here. Although the heart rate is, uh, I won't call it as sinus bradycardia, but it's slightly on the lower side. And in fact, the J, J wave, so this is the J, J point is of course elevated with two spikes in fact. So what is called as the high takeoff. Isn't it? Similarly, even the QT interval seems to be pretty prolonged over here. So there are various ways in which you will be able to notice the fragmented QRS. So in the form of it could be a R dash R dash pattern. Those, these are those different patterns and they will be notching of the S wave and notching of the R or even the this. So a lot of times it may look a little bit similar but remember they all are not the same. They are very much in fact different. And different in the sense, uh, for example, even if you will try to look over here, they all will tend to look the same. But they are not the same, right? So, so that's why I had said it is if you are trying to see a patient with, uh, and you can use it as a effective screening and also prognostic tool. So, for example, you may come across such ECG changes in the patients with the tetralogy or phthalate, otherwise channelopathies or even hereditary cardiomyopathies as well. Hereditary cardiomyopathies like the patients with ARVC, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or even the dilated cardiomyopathy. So, uh, such kind of problems may also you will be seeing is if there has been a congenital heart disease who has already been operated so such patients are also predisposed for such fatal chances in the sense TOF. So does anyone remember what are the components of TOF? So first question is how many components TOF has? Pulmonary stenosis, overriding of aorta, ventricular septal defect and... And? RVH. Hi, wonderful, man. wonderful, Dr. Alagan. I'm so happy. So there are a few people who are awake as well. Wonderful. So very, very nice. So what happens is, see, in the congenital heart disease, it's not like this. Once you operate those patients, you are done. No. After that, you will even have to be more alert. So because those patients will be having arrhythmias, those patients will be having some other problems as well you need to do a regular follow-up of such patients as well and in fact what is going to happen is uh, whenever the surgery is done it tends to also affect the electrical conduction system and in fact almost 90 percent of those patients will be having right bundle branch block so as i as you already said it 
uh, those features which are present so due to their correction so there are some side effects as well and in fact if these patients will be having a prolonged QRS duration okay and then and the progression of this duration as well is almost like more than five milliseconds per year over 10 year period it is definitely a predictive of sudden cardiac death and what happens is the higher rate of ectopy and the non-sustained VT tends to be associated with VT inducibility as well. So in fact, this is one of the patients whose uh, ECG was taken after the TOFRIF AF. However, what do you notice? So anyone would like to try this ECG? So you'd start with the rate, rhythm, axis and then any changes and all. So for example, this is definitely sinus rhythm. Okay. Hello. This is uh, this is not Hello. no this is not tachycardia. So what do you, ag again you notice is there is bundle branch block pattern. Uh, yes, sinus rhythm, bundle branch block That's and off funny. right bundle branch block. And the QRS duration is also pretty Where prolonged. Okay. So these are the patients. Razia Sharu, please mute your microphone. So, so then what happens is this is one of the patients of the post of repair who developed the VT. And what do we notice in this uh, VT is uh, this was most it was due to actually macro reentry around the right ventriculotomy scar. In fact, and then what happens is when you will be going through uh, the arrhythmias. Uh, some of those major factors which tend to cause these problems is QRS duration of more than 180 milliseconds. Similarly, as we had already said, it is the QRS duration which tends to keep on increasing with passage of time. And of course, you, if you are able to see the ventricular arrhythmias on the ECGs, so of course, you will be able to know these are the patients who are at risk. So, if anyone would like to recall, what are those arrhythmias, like which are the predisposing factors for such kind of sudden cardiac arrest or even these complex arrhythmias which will be coming up? Can anyone recall? Focal. Yes. Mm -hmm, good. Right. And so these are the structure. If these are the structural heart disease patients, right? So what about those channelopathies? We also learned about the channelopathies, right? Long QT syndrome. Right. Short QT. Yes. Short QT. Right. Right. So you all are the masters now, okay? you will be all able to take care of those complex arrhythmias patients, whoever comes to you with all these problems, right? Now you all are very smart people. So, so what happens is, uh, you should be aware that, yes, ECG is a very important vital tool for detecting those patients uh, who are getting predisposed to sinus or sudden cardiac death. But ECG cannot diagnose all those all of them not all of them okay especially a lot of times uh, if there is problem with the congenital coronary anomaly Daljeet Singh please mute your microphone uh, so then what happens is if someone is having a premature atherosclerotic coronary artery disease and all so those kind of things you will not be able to diagnose using the uh, ECG itself. To summarize, so some of the things which we all already said it, you should be try to be careful, especially using ECG is in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, like you will be able to notice left ventricular hypertrophy with abnormal Q waves, and there will be left atrial enlargement, and there will be ST ch segment changes, or even the T wave inversions as well. 
and the A or VD patients will tend to have the epsilon waves and T wave inversion V1 to V3. Similarly, if there is a patient of a prolonged QT interval, okay, and so those are the, uh, I, yeah, prolonged QT intervals, as I had already said it, three types may be present, type 1, 2, 3, so type 1 is the one which will tend to happen mostly during activity, activities like, or even during emotions, so like swimming, someone may having, then the type 2 was the one which needs a auditory stimulus. So, for example, loud telephone ringing. Otherwise, the second thing will be is postpartum. Postpartum cardiac problems. And the type 3 was the one with SCN5 wave mutation. Okay. SCN5, yeah. And that was during rest or sleeping, in fact. So, don't forget that. Then the, there were other uh, changes as well, which I had already said it, microvolt T-wave alternance due to the beat-to-beat -beat variability, isn't it? So then we already spoke about the Brugada syndrome. So in the Brugada syndrome, what do you notice is the coved ST elevation. Otherwise, you notice is that saddleback pattern, saddleback pattern in the sense of, so the coved ST segment is the one which is present in the type 1. And in the type 2 and 3, you notice is the saddleback pattern, in fact. Similarly, if in an ECG you see is malignant early repolarization or the CPVT or even fragmented QRS. Otherwise, if po after post TOF repair, if the QRS is more than 180 milliseconds. So, thank you so much. Are there any questions? Hello. Yeah. Are there any questions? Tell me. Yes, sir. Please. Uh,